Good evening. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this in, in invitation. It really is a, a fantastic uh, location and we're really all very pleased to do this. Um, what I'm going to do at the start is just give some introductions of the panel so you know um, who you're tangling with and then just quickly run through the format. So if I start straight away by saying on my far right, I've got Phil Lowry here. He, um, his background is he's got a master's qualifications, two of them, in business and science, before, however, understanding the real meaning of life and getting into brewing. And that began in, uh, in 1996. He's had various roles and international experience. He's considered, particularly in the uh, London area, but throughout the country, as a, as a brewing guru. He's someone that people go to to get clear advice, and he's also a beer writer. Uh, he now works for Bath uh, Haas, which are a hop company based in Kent, but he covers all of Europe. To my immediate right, a man that should need no introduction, but I will do, because he likes to hear it all again. He achieved A-levels before starting work with Truman's in their laboratory in 1968. He's become, uh, through the uh, industry's examination system, a fully qualified brewer. He moved over to Young's in 1989, becoming their brewing manager, and then subsequently moved again over to their arch rivals, Fuller's, in 2006, again as brewing manager. He, uh, from 2013, which, by the way, was the year he was voted Brewer of the Year. How good is that on your CV? Uh, he also, in the same year, um, became involved with Wimbledon Brewery, which is where he's now located. And he's done various consulting jobs and, as I say, um, a guru in the industry. To my left is uh, Neil. Neil um, became educated uh, with his first degree in natural science and plant molecular biology. Um, uh, but since then, um, uh, he, looks, he currently looks after a research group who are looking at uh, immunology, and he's based at Cambridge University. However, again, he found the true light and meaning of life when he became interested in home brewing in 2011 this followed work at the Cambridge Beer Festival, and since 2006, I believe, he's been the deputy head cellar manager. Now, believe you me, that is a really important role. Uh, in my own case, sorry, I got a degree in biology, the, the number one of all natural sciences, in, uh, I think, qualified in 79, when I started work at the Courage's Brewery, the original brewery by um, Tower Bridge. Since then, over many years, I've worked at eight breweries in the UK, around the country, um, and along that way became trained, got an MSc in brewing and the Master Brewer qualification as well. In 2010, however, I set up with some friends uh, Windsor and Eaton Brewery. So I've gone from the big brewers to the small brewers, as Derek has. That's your panel for the evening. The format is going to be that Derek is going to kick off with a talk on the theory of malting and brewing on a commercial scale. And he's going to cover all of the basic science in brewing. I must warn you, this is a 46 slide presentation. So if you suffer from strobe effects, please <laughs> keep your eyes closed. We know you're not sleeping. You're just trying to avoid the damaging effects. Um, after Derek has spoken, then Phil will take over and give a, a talk on hops. And really, um, they are the flavor of the decade. If you're at all interested in beer, hops are the big, big subject at present. And Phil will cover that. Um, and hopefully, there'll be some samples coming around. And then we'll move over to Neil, who will talk about doing it yourself, using the technical skills of science, but in a much more artful and, some might say, rewarding way. So Neil will do that. We'll finish with a questions and answers session. If we run out of time, we'll do that over a beer in the best industry standards. I hope that's the format we're going to follow. So I'm going to hand over to Derek, who will take us through the basic theory of malting and brewing. Yeah, well, 
know the brewing world. It is quite small and, uh, uh, and sort of it's slightly incestuous, but uh, uh, I, do, um, I do know quite a few people in the industry. It is quite a small world. Um, and the other thing I would say is that the brewers, by their almost definition, tend to be jack of all trades and masters of none. So we tend to cover a whole range of, of sciences and arts to some extent uh, without really mastering anything. So that's why we ended up as brewers, I always think. We certainly weren't clever enough to be scientists. So now I have to work out the technology. So if you'll excuse me a moment, that's all right. You stay there, Carrie. I think I might be able to manage it. How about that? There you go. That's it. People of my age shouldn't do too much technology. Right. Um, OK, so um, really I'm going to uh, base the talk around about the flavour of beer and where those flavours come from. So that's the slide. And as, uh, um, as opening, as Paddy said, I do w watch out for the flashing lights. Um, there are four main raw materials for, for making beer. Uh, and I will talk a little bit briefly about each of them. Um, most people know that beer is made using hops. Uh, in fact, that really only came in over the last 500 years. Uh, but the main raw material for making beer is, is water. We need a lot of water when we make beer. Uh, but it's malted barley. Uh, malted cereals, you can make beer from, from most cereals. But the bar uh, uh, cereal of choice is malted barley. And that's what gives us the heart of the beer. Um, then we're following on with the hops. They come in a little bit later. Uh, if I was a chef, these would be my spices, my herbs that we're going to use to help uh, introduce different flavors and characters into the beer. Um, and then we're going to use the yeast. The yeast is our final, uh, and this is where the biology comes in. That's why you'll find a lot of biologists in brewing. Um, the yeast is going to transform what is a very uh, nutritious sweet solution into uh, something that we also think is very nutritious, not quite so sweet and mildly alcoholic. So uh, there we go. Water. It takes round about four pints, in, in modern industry terms, round about four pints. There are some uh, of the better, um, very efficient breweries getting lower than that, but uh, a sort of industry standard would be about four pints of water for every pint of beer produced. Um, so it is quite a, 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 a sort of major part to, that the brewer has to look into. Uh, and indeed, the quality and the mineral content and makeup of the water um, does make quite a difference to the style of beer. And before, we had chemists able to analyze the water and work out where those differences were coming from, the different ionic constituents. Um, brewers really braced their breweries around places of, 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 of natural water that suited the beer. So let's look at the way in which uh, water can affect the flavor of the beer. First of all, we like to have clean water. So we don't want any taints, and that includes things like the River Wandle and things like that, for those that know Young's Brewery, down by the River Wandle, um, and any other nasty things in it. So we'd like to have it nice and clean. Um, we do want a mineral content. Uh, it's quite important the way in which the brewing process proceeds, as we'll see later. So we do want mineral ions, and, and those are quite specific about the ones we want. Uh, we like it mildly acidic. We, um, we well, I'll cover it in a minute, but it's mildly acidic. Um, and certainly um, the next one, oh, sorry, 94%, uh, which I'll explain in a minute, with the hardness. So the main uh, constituent, if you live in London, those of you who live in London, you'll know that your water has a lot of temporary hardness, um, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonates, and when we boil them, they'll, they'll come out. Um, these have a rather negative effect. As brewers, we like calcium, particularly British brewers. Continental brewers, not quite so keen on the calcium. Uh, but British brewers like a lot of calcium, uh, but we don't like the carbonate so much. Not so bad when you're brewing darker beers, but not very good on pale beers. So if you're in London, or in Dublin, or in, indeed in Munich, to make a paler beer, you really need to treat the water in some way to reduce the carbonate side of it. And that can be done in a number of ways. Um, so, uh, and there's a few there. The, what we call permanent hardness, those brought by sulfates, we, we really like those. And that's why Burton became a center for brewing pale beers. Um, there's a lot of, uh, when the water percolates through the, the ground there, it percolates through gypsum beds, and it picks up a lot of calcium sulfate. Uh, and there's a British pale ale brewer 
Uh, for me, I like lots of calcium sulfate. So, uh, okay. Uh, moving on to malted barley, why, why have brewers chosen barley in particular as their cereal of choice? And what, what does the word malting mean? So that's what we're going to look at. Um, well, what, what comes from the cereal? It is a, a cereal crop, and obviously um, brewing's been going on for thousands of years, probably uh, almost as long as agriculture, uh, and people were harvesting cereals. Beer was probably made in some format, along with bread making. It, it's very ancient and certainly predates wine making by quite some thousands of years. Um, but barley became the, 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 the cereal of choice. Um, but to make it suitable for us, uh, we do need to malt it, to let it process a bit. Which I'll, uh, but what it provides, it provides the starch, which provides the sugars, that will then go on to fermentation, provide the food stock for the, the nutrition material for the yeast. But they also within the barley corn, there's a, there's a lot of protein uh, during the storage, is mapped, uh, wrapped up in protein, um, and the starch granules are, are locked into the protein material. And that is broken down during the malting process to provide amino compounds, uh, which will provide the building blocks that the yeast will need during its life. Um, pretty much uh, we use uh, f uh, f about 15 kilos of, of malt for uh, 100 litres of a, a 5% beer. So we use quite a lot of malt. Um, we chose uh, the barley corn, as I said, because it has a lot of benefits for the brewer. Um, over and above wheat, one of the things about wheat is that when you harvest it and thresh it, the outside part, the husk comes off, which doesn't make it so suitable for making beer, but you can make wheat beers, and, and uh, uh, there's quite a few. There, you'll, uh, some of you may know of the Weiss beers and the Witt beers of, uh, of, of Germany and Belgium. Um, but you would normally, typically, only use it to round about 40%. Uh, during the germination process, um, which will we'll start the protein material. First of all, the cell wall material is starting to break down. We'll break that down uh, into pentasans and, and glucans. Uh, they're broken down. Uh, the cellulose material is broken down first off inside the barley corn. And then the natural enzyme process will start to work on the amino compounds, uh, the proteins to break them down into soluble amino compounds. And these are going to be used by the budding corn to produce rootlets and indeed a shoot eventually. Um, and the starch will then be made ready to produce the food stuff that will fuel the whole thing and allow the plant to grow into a new plant. So the malting process is a controlled germination. Uh, a few hundred years ago, most breweries would have done their own malting. There are some breweries which uh, still do that, but not so many now. And most of the malting is done at uh, sales maltsters. And typically in UK, they're in the big barley growing regions. They're in the, uh, in, in the east uh, of England, in East Anglia, and further north up the east coast there are the, are the big barley malting growing areas, and some in the West Country as well. So our barley provides the source of starch, proteins, and enzymes. Um, and the first thing we do is that we'll be looking to provide the starch for the mental sugars. I've done that one, and I've covered that. So let's talk about the process. So um, barley is taken from the field. We then wet it down. We're recreating spring. We're going to steep it. it takes about 48 hours. And we're going to give it a few rests in between. Imagine spring rains. And it will start to sprout. Um, and then we'll put it into a germination area, allowing it to grow. And you can see on the little picture there, the little rootlets that have started to grow out. Um, and inside the shoot will be growing up inside the grain. But all those changes, the breakdown of the cell wall material, the breakdown of the protein material, will be ongoing inside there. Um, there's some lovely uh, terms here. Um, the, on the right, we're at the end of uh, steeping, where the little uh, rootlets are just poking their noses out. This is what the maltster would call chitting. And they'll, at the end of germination, they'll pick up the germinating grain and they'll give it a good rub in their hand and they'll look for a, a floweriness as opposed to a steeliness. Uh, and then 
The final process, the germination is about four to five days in, in a different way, and then that's killed off, it's dried off. We try, we're dried off in such a way that the natural enzyme systems are preserved. Um, so we'll just dry it out very gently to preserve those enzyme systems because we're going to use those in the brewery. Um, and at this stage, Paddy, I think you might pass some samples around. But, uh, um, there's a slide there which is too busy. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm certainly not going to talk about it. Uh, I want to keep you awake. Um, Paddy's actually putting round some malted barley samples. Uh, we uh, didn't bring in some barley for you to try, but if I gave you some barley, you'd see the difference. It looks the same, but it tastes really, really different. Um, the, what you, you can actually chew this and hopefully you'll get a nice sort of, we call it malty and, and the marketing people always get upset with brewers. They, uh, they'll say, they ask us about a flavor and, and we'll say, well, it's malty. And they'll say, well, what's malty mean? There is no other word. I can't think of another word. So out there in the audience, when it comes to question time, if you've got another word for malty, I'd be delighted to hear it. So, uh, but anyway, uh, like a lot of flavorists nowadays, uh, and I was quite interested in that talk that you got coming up in January, that sounds quite good, but uh, the flavor -suticals? no, what was it called? Nutraceuticals, Nutraceuticals yeah. Uh, but the flavor industry is having lots of fun at the moment with flavors and things. But funny enough, the brewing industry has, has been at the forefront of scientific research in many ways, and I believe that the flavor wheels actually started in the brewing industry, is that right, Paddy? I believe so, Dave. Yeah. At least we claim to. We claim to. I'm sure everybody else does. Anyway, so flavor wheels, some of you may be in flavor chemistry, may have seen flavor wheels in different formats. Um, this is a spider graph, if you like, based on a sort of um, uh, a, a wheel structure. Again, not quite the flavor wheel that we'll see in a minute. Um, but um, the way in which we kill the malt, the way in which we germinate the malt can lead to differences in the malt flavor. And we're passing around the parallel malt. Uh, we're also passing around the speciality malt, which I'll cover in a sec. But the flavor profile of a lager malt is, the lager malt is not quite so well modified as an ale malt. Um, and it will have slightly more of the grainy, green, grassy notes. Uh, and you may notice that in the flavor of the beer. Uh, the ale malt will go through more to that malty character. Uh, so there's the spidergram for a, an ale malt. So we're moving more to around that sort of malty, sweeter, uh, slightly darker flavors, if you like. Uh, and some of these flavors are called, I'll throw this one in because there's chemists out there, uh, from the Maillard reactions. During the heating process, uh, we'll get some combinations between sugars and amino compounds, this Maillard reaction. If I've pronounced that correctly, I'm not sure. Somebody out there will correct me, I'm sure. Um, but um, so the, these are some of the uh, uh, end results when you put it on the flavor group. Uh, one of the malts that's being passed around is a crystal malt. I think it's a crystal 400. Um, during the roasting process, this is done in a slightly different way. Uh, rather than just gently kilning it out, it's done in something akin to a coffee roaster. And the green malt, so it's still got lots of moisture in it, will be put into a coffee roaster. And the whole thing is brought up. It goes through a conversion stage and then a stewing stage. And it will all be very much speeded up with temperature. And that's controlled. And then it will caramelize inside and then crystallize, which is why it's called crystal malt. And you can take that even further to make chocolate malt. There is no chocolate used in making chocolate malt. So those that are chocolate lovers, there's no harm done to chocolate. So um, you're all right on that front. Um, and these are some of the flavor profiles. Again, moving around our flavor wheel into some of the burnt, the treacly, the, the more toffee tasting uh, notes as opposed to the other side. Um, again, there's one for the chocolate. And you'll notice that as you're roasting, you'll get a degree of astringency coming. Uh, and again, we've got some samples outside as well as the ones uh, that they've got there. So do take the chance afterwards to just have a little taste. Now, as brewers, we'll be blending these together in various different ways, what we, may, what we call the grist, uh, which I'll come on to in a minute. So what does our malt bring to the flavor of the beer? It can bring grainy flavors, sweet corny flavors, 
coffee flavours from some of the coloured ones, uh, roasted flavours from darker malts, toffee flavours from those mid-coloured malts, chocolate from the darker ones. So these are some of the flavour combinations that we bring together. I sometimes pity our poor winemakers, you know, because they, you know, they've got one thing, and even then they get it wrong, because they've harvested the grape, all right, and the grape is there. The best bit, the heart of it, ours is the kernel. Ours is the barley corn. The grape, the heart of it, the goodness, all the good bit, is in the pip. That gets thrown away, as does most of the skin. All you get left is the sugar, really. The sugar around the outside that is just there to attract animals. And that's all the winemaker's got to work on. He can play around with yeast and things, and he can leave the skins in for a bit longer. But that's it, really. We've got such a huge palette to be able to play with. Um, it's marvellous. I've started that a bit early, but never mind. Um, oh, biscuity. Yeah, that's another one. Right. Um, as well as malted barley, we can use other, what we call them adjuncts or other materials. I talked about wheat. You can use maize, rice. These, you can use these. These are very light compared to a, a malted barley in terms of the flavour. The starch you get is very clean. If you imagine rice, is virtually all just neat starch. Uh, am I meant to call it? A myelopectin and things like that. No, I'm sure. I'm sure they all know what I mean. Um, so, um, so it's a very clean, if you like, very neutral source of uh, material for making beer. And if you want a really light, clean beer, then you'll use a percentage of uh, rice or maize in your beer. Um, if you want a really dark beer, you may even use some roast barley. Particularly if you're Irish, you'll be using roast barley. Again, because it's roasted direct, you'll get very astringent flavours. I think there is a sample of roast barley outside, I think, so have a try of that. And compare it to the chocolate milk, because there's an interesting difference. Helps to decide between an Irish dry stout uh, and a more fuller <laughs> London stout. So, um, various reasons. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about hops I'm not doing on time. You're OK. I'm all right. OK. Um, hops, as I mentioned earlier, are a little bit like uh, the herbs you would use in cooking, the spice that you would bring in, but they bring more than that. They bring just more than flavour. They bring a whole host of things to the table. Um, they will bring bitterness. I think that's most people know that they bring bitterness. But to derive that bitterness, um, it's in the hops, and, and Phil will talk a little bit more about this in the form of alpha acids. Um, to, to actually get them soluble, we need to boil that alpha acid. We need to heat it uh, and boil it to convert it into an iso-alpha acid. Uh, and then it becomes soluble. Uh, and uh, so some of the hops where we want the bitterness, we will use at the start of the boiling process, after we've extracted from the malted barley, we'll be using those at the start. But others we'll be using later on in the process, as I'll be describing, and Phil will be expanding on. Um, so you're going to get aroma compounds. Now, during the boil, obviously, I'm going to lose those. So um, as I mentioned uh, just then, we'll be looking to add some of those later in the process. Um, but they have some other effects as well. They enhance foam. And they have a natural antimicrobial action, which is probably the prime reason that they were the herb of choice that was used in beer making. 500 years ago, there were all sorts of things, particularly in the UK, uh, being used to brew beer. Uh, we, talk, we talked about one or two earlier, St John's work being one, and Bog Myrtle, and, uh, and a few others. So there are all hosts. But one of the real advantages of using hops, it has this nat natural antimicrobial action. Um, and there aren't that many, fortunately, that many organisms that can survive in beer once it's fermented. Uh, but the one group that can are the lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus, etc. And the hops have a particular uh, action on reducing those. So um, there's all sorts of good things that they bring to the table. A little bit about hop growing. Um, it's a perennial plant, so there's a rootstock that grows up each year. They are related to nettles, uh, dogwood, I think, for some reason. Um, but its closest relative is cannabis. 
So uh, his closest cousin is cannabis. Mm. Uh, we've, uh, I, we were, again, we were talking about this briefly uh, and with these new vaporizing things, but apparently I think it only sends you to sleep, so uh, it doesn't do anything else. Uh, and it won't get you drunk. But uh, anyway, they grow up wire work. T uh, traditionally, they grow up tall wire work, and you can see somebody in there at the early start. Um, and you can, and we have a small group called the London Brewers Alliance, actually, and Phil helped start that group. Uh, Paddy and I are both sort of early members. Uh, despite Windsor and Eaton being slightly outside the N25. Yeah, geography of mine is not a strong point. So. <laughs> Um, but um, we have this, we go out uh, uh, round about April, May time and pick some of the hop shoots and you can actually use them in the same way as you use asparagus tips. Uh, they're not quite as tasty as asparagus, but they're not bad, particularly with lots of butter and garlic and scallops and things like that. So, you know, if you use a bit of imagination, you can turn them into something. And if you get the right variety, they're not too bitter. So, um, um, but they're a climbing plant. And, and they are fascinating. When you, as brewers, we get invited on hot walks. And every time I go on a hot walk, I learn something new. And it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but they're amazing things. They've got their own inbuilt calendar. Uh, they'll climb and they climb. And I can never remember which way it is. But they climb the opposite way. Their rotation is in the opposite way to runner beans. So if you've got any gardens out there can tell me which way one goes, I'll know for the future when, which way the hop goes. Uh, but it climbs up and up. And it will climb up until Midsummer's Day. It's daylight decides where you can grow hops and it will climb up the vine until Midsummer's Day and at Midsummer's Day on the dot it stops growing up and then puts out the laterals and that's where the flowers will develop. So uh, there you go. Uh, and the flowers, the female flowers will then develop the cones. Uh, we call them flowers or hop flowers but uh, they're actually the, modi well, it's the fruiting body uh, so they're not true petals, uh, they're bracteoles, uh, but it's in the, can't point with this, but in that bit is the bit we're after, and only a little tiny part of that, uh, something called the lupulin glands. They're harvested round about September, um, uh, end of August, September. They used to be harvested and picked by hand, and probably the best hops were always picked by hand, so you didn't do too much bruising, etc. Um, but it's quite, you know, we, we, um, it used to be something where all the Londoners would go out for their holiday and pick hops. We don't have so many of them, although London's getting bigger. Maybe we could try it again. Um, but you've got mechanical ways of picking now, and you'd, typically you'll bring down a vine and, and shove it through a hop picking machine. Uh, and we poor brewers sometimes pick the little fingers, metal fingers that strip them off. When we're using whole hops, you'll find one or two of those springs in your, in your hop pocket as well. But um, the, uh, there's been quite a lot of development work. We have one of the foremost plant breeders in the country in hops. Uh, it, I'm fortunate to have a chap called Peter Darby, and he's done a lot of work with uh, what we call low trellis work hops. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so there's, there's all sorts of work being going on and a lot of the, what do we call them, nutraceuticals. They have found a lot of use because of this antimicrobial effect, but there's also 101 other things uh, that are present in hops, some anti-carcinogenic characteristics. So there's a lot of research going on in the hop field. Um, what do they bring though in terms of flavour? I, again, I won't dwell on this too much. It certainly can bring spiciness, fruitiness, floweriness, herbal, skunk, skunk uh, skunkiness. I've never, I know what sunstruck is. These are some of the downsides. The ones on the right are positive. Some of these on the left are not quite so positive. Skunk is a, is a, is a, is a reaction of some of the hot products with light with UV light and um, as brewers we will always promote the use of something as a barrier to prevent light hitting the beer. So you'll notice that most brewers have amber bottles, brown bottles if you like, and really for us the deeper the brown the better. So we're not so keen on the light green and we're not so keen, certainly not very keen at all on very light flint bottles um, because you do get this UV reaction with some of the hot components. Um, and you can sometimes get cheesiness. But if you imagine, this is like the herbs, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we have it dried when it comes to us and in different forms we can get it in whole leaf form, 
uh, whole cone form, which you can see there. Um, hold on, just go back a bit. How am I doing on time, Paddy? Keep moving. Keep moving, all right, I won't show you anymore. Or we can get it in pelletized forms, and Phil's very kindly bought some samples and more outside. Right, brewing process. Now, how are we going to convert all these materials to give us the sugars that we're going to need for fermentation? Um, and during the fermentation, our yeast will convert that into alcohol, carbon dioxide, heat, and a little bit of glycerol. Um, a very busy slide again, um, and I haven't really got too much time to talk you through it, but you can see the arrow going through from the barley collected in the field, across the maltings at the top, into the brewery where we're going to mill the malted barley, that you've all now seen and tasted, hopefully. Then through the brewing process, which I'll describe a bit more in, the, in a few more detailed slides. And then through matura fermentation, maturation, and then finally into packaging. And what it really should show is the customer, the final customer, because the brewer's job doesn't finish until the customer's got an empty glass and he says, I'd like another. That's when, he job, that's when you know his job's done. Right, so let's uh, just uh, do a quick romp through the brewing process. Milling. Um, most of you are probably fairly familiar with milling, so I won't dwell too much on that. If anybody's got any questions on milling, you can do it dry, you can do it wet, you can do it different ways, but it depends on your brewing. So there's a sample there of a traditional mill and then on the right-hand side of a wet mill. Mashing, again, various technologies come into play. The basic process hasn't altered. Um, a lot of breweries, continental breweries, split uh, the operation of mashing and extraction into two. So they'll have a mashing and a mash conversion, uh, followed by a separation. Traditional British breweries uh, use something called a mash tun, where they do conversion and separation in a single tun. So uh, the top picture shows a sample of a traditional mash tun with a special machine for mashing it in, mixing it with the water. Um, and the one below shows uh, a grist hydrator, and inside that vessel you'll find a big stirrer and probably a heater as well. Uh, separating the mash. In a mash tun, it's all done into one vessel. There's a big false bottom. Um, in the louter tun, there's a series of rakes, and it's a much wider, uh, you might have a much narrower bed. Or you could actually filter it. Uh, but they do the same thing. We're looking to convert the starch into sugars. The, pro the proteins were already made into amino compounds. They will be solubilized, they go into solution, and we're looking to extract that from the outside of the grain, the husk. Um, using the husk as a deep filter bed, uh, and we're going to get this lovely, clear, sweet, very, very nutritious solution we call wort, derived from that. Um, it's got everything that most life forms need. Uh, there's a carbohydrate spectrum, there's an amino spectrum, there's trace elements, there's minerals, there's vitamins, there's liquid fiber. It's got it all. Unlike the poor winemaker, just sugar. No good. Bit of, bit of nice from the grape skin, but nah. Right, anyway, so we take this very nutritious solution and then we actually make it taste a bit funny because we're going to add the hops and that will provide the bitterness into the beer and flavor and some of these have forming compounds. And there are some lovely reactions uh, going on between uh, polyphenols um, and uh, some of the um, uh, amino compounds, polypeptides uh, going on in there as well to form another lovely term called trub, hot break and trub. Are you gonna talk about that in your talk, Neil? Do you do trub separation do do in trub. homebrew? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, nice Anglo-Saxon word. Lots of Anglo-Saxon words. What, like louder? Yeah, like louder, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, boiling. There you see a chap traditionally adding whole leaf hops. Um, and we can add those at the stars of the boil, which will, will be deriving predominantly the bittering compounds and some of the uh, more stable flavor compounds. Uh, but we'll add some at the end of the boil. They're a nice little, because hops are very much flavor of the decade, as Paddy was saying, lots of hugely hop beers out there, having years of hops being almost in the doldrums and beers being, they're bitter, but the, bitter, the hops didn't have a major feature in the beer. Uh, 
particularly in some of the lager beers, the hops are very much subdued. They're there, they're definitely there. You know they're there, but they're not major players. Um, but with the resurgence in the craft sector, and particularly with the Americans, who have gone from very clean, very low threshold tasting beers to the right at the opposite end of the scale. Uh, with some of these enormous hop varieties that are available. Um, and they'll be added towards the end, late copper, or in something we call hop nix. So um, we'll then remove the, some of the trub, this protein polyphenol complexing that we've created during the boil uh, in either a whirlpool or, or a hop back or a hop nick. And we're going to cool it down. Um, and then these are some of the, because oh, this was um, based on flavor, but these are some of the flavors that can come from the brewing process. You're going to get more of this Maillard reaction. You're going to get more of this uh, car uh, carbohydrate and amino compound, uh, compounds coming together to form flavor and color compounds. You're extracting the bitterness. You will either generate and remove or generate and leave in. Uh, another one of these wonderful flavors, which is malt derived primarily. Um, most brewers liken it to smelling or tasting like sweet corn. Um, it has a, a, quite a well-known name known as dimethyl sulfide. Um, and it has this sort of uh, cooked vegetable quite taste. It used to be very prevalent on lagers and, until the famous German university decided that it wasn't quite so uh, uh, desirable anymore, and then all the German brewers started taking it out. So, quite a quite a change round for them. Um, you can get multi sweet character, the biscuit character, uh, and that takes us on to the yeast. Wonderful organism, uh, single celled organism, uh, generally reproduces asexually by budding. We'll add yeast, and most brewers will nurture their yeast. They'll either use it continuously, particularly if they're top cropping. Uh, or, or they'll grow it up from a, a slope, a laboratory slope, and reculture it and introduce it into their fermentations. But they tend to look after their yeast. It does a lot of work for us. Now, to actually start off and reproduce and keep it healthy and viable, you need to give it oxygen at the start of the process. Um, and that allows it to grow. And it will metabolize in the same way that we do, breaking down sugars into carbon dioxide, water, and deriving energy, lots of energy when you do that. Um, but it's a little bit more adept than we are because that oxygen is all used up pretty much in the first six hours or so, probably even less of the fermentation process. Uh, and then the yeast is able to go anaerobic. Um, and it goes partly way down the, the pathway, but it can only go as far. And it re actually reduces it down as alcohol through through the process and then excretes the alcohol out of the cell. But it's derived, still deriving energy, still able to grow. It won't reproduce anymore, but it'll happily ferment, which is useful for us. And then at the end of the process, it'll actually do something nice as well. It'll come together, flocculate. Uh, it will either accumulate on the top, and hence the term top fermenting, although it's only at the end of the fermentation that it goes to the top, or it'll just by gravity, not flocculate as much and sink to the bottom. Uh, bottom fermentation or bottom cropping, we probably uh, would prefer to call it. And there's some, uh, there's some pictures there of a traditional top cropping yeast. And you can see that at the end of fermentation, the yeast is coming up to the top. Uh, and in, in the bottom left-hand picture there, you'll see a picture of what we, most brewers will use, uh, very commonly use, certainly the bigger brewers, cylindrochronicles, where you allow the yeast to settle. Um, <clears throat> there are some differences in the yeast which help establish the beer styles. Uh, very much so. Uh, most ales and quite a lot of other continental styles of beers, the Belgian beers, for example, the Dortmunder Alp beers, a lot of the traditional beers are produced using Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and this is traditionally known as a top fermenter, but if you do leave it, and there are certainly lots of ale strains which will crop to the bottom as well. Um, 
Fermentation, typically temperatures around about 16 to 20. It's a warm fermenter, it racks quite fast. It will produce quite a lot of estuary flavors. It's a very active thing and it's producing lots of flavor compounds, kicking them out while it's getting on the, the job of be, being a very fast fermenter. Uh, and it can be ready to drink within a week, more typically two to three weeks. Uh, there are a lot of different strains, all with their own flavor profiles, and it's quite a, a world in itself. Um, so quite a lot there. The lager yeasts almost exclusively will sink to the bottom. Um, and they are a slightly different species. And this is the taxonomists have been round and round on this. For a long time, it was known as Saccharomyces uh, carlsbergensis, uh, and then other brewers took exception about that. Uh, and that's because it was identified and, and isolated at the, uh, the Jakobsen lab up in, uh, up in uh, Denmark there. But uh, uh, it's Pastorianus, although it is believed to be a, a, a substrain between Cerevisiae and another one called Bianus. But the key thing about it is that it operates at lower temperatures. Its fermentation is a, a lower and slower rate. It's happily fermenting at lower temperatures. It was better and best used, and they were able to brew for longer in the caves certainly down uh, in, in the Czech, Bohemian and Bavarian region, which is where it developed and then really took over the world style over the last 100 years or so, just over 100 years. But it's not been around that long. So it's really only this last 100 years before that we had all sorts of world styles, including the London Porters and the IPAs. So um, tends to be low in fruit and ester character, has that slight graininess, which is also from the malt derived. Uh, and it does to remove one of the components, the isotol, take a long time because it's a lower temperature. There's one more family, if you like, and those are slightly wild. It's difficult for me to describe that. And these are almost known as spontaneous fermentations. And this is where you're going to rely on the natural flora. Uh, that are present in either the brew house or in the atmosphere around where you're doing it. And you'll actually lay out the wort after boiling in these great big long shallow pans. There'll be a lot of water vapor, steam, water vapor condensing on the rafters and things like that. The air blows in and the natural yeast will effectively rain down and seed your beer. It's a very strange process. You can get some very strange results, but there are some fantastic beers. You normally have to leave them for about two years. Um, they can be quite tart, quite acidic. Uh, they're not to everybody's liking, but by blending, carefully blending, perhaps with fruit, uh, you can produce some absolutely wonderful beers. Um, there's a very busy slide. Uh, the only thing I want to say on there, I mentioned about diacetyl. Diacetyl, when the yeast is very active, is pushed out from the cell, but it is still a food stock and is able to be brought back in and reabsorbed. It's, it gives, some beers like it, um, some brewers like it. To some extent, it gives a lot of body, a lot of mouthfeel, but at higher levels, it comes across as quite a toffee, cloying taste. So, um, but there's a, a whole host of things that we haven't got time to talk about it. So I'll talk about, briefly about fermentation flavors, warming, acidic, fruity, butterscotch, that's the diacetyl one, green apples, that's an aldehyde one. Ah, the flavor will. Um, so, as I say, I think this, uh, I've read somewhere that this sort of was largely developed and, uh, in the brewing industry because brewers are not very adventurous when it comes to words, so the flavorists had to give us a hand uh, and they developed these flavor wheels. And there are some really good ones of these around, uh, but uh, uh, we still use the same old malty and things like that. And hoppy, and they say, well, what's hoppy mean? Well, spicy, hop, floral, hop, things like that. But what we're gonna do and what we have done once my colleagues are finished, there are some samples out there, and we're going to let you try them, and then you could give us the flavors back. So, uh, these are some of the beers we've got. Fuller's have very kindly given us some Frontier, which is a lagered beer, um, and uh, it has a full 42 days in lagering. But it does use American hops in this beer. So it's got a combination here, if you like. It's what they call a new world lager almost. 
Um, there is some Fuller's London Pride, and to, oh sorry, I should say a, a, a typical ale, so this is the ale yeast, and you will see some of those crystal malt characters come into it, and the use of English hops. So we've had some American hops, then got some English hops, and then uh, their porter to demonstrate the darker malts coming through so that you'll get an idea of those colored malts, brown malt, chocolate malt coming through here uh, on that one. It does use a very old variety of hop called Fuggle, just a single one. Not one hop, the one variety. <laughs> Is that me? Uh, there's some Golden Pride, a stronger beer. And here you'll notice more of the yeast. The yeast takes more action here because it's a stronger beer. And you'll get some lovely warming, uh, higher alcohol notes, some plum notes, some deep orange marmalade notes, both coming from the malts and from the yeast. Um, I brought some of my own uh, common pal ale for you, uh, just to try a very quick, simple drinking beer. Uh, but for those that have ever drunk Young's beers, you'll know that they had a beer called Ordinary. We weren't allowed to call it Ordinary in the brewery. It had to be Young's Bitter, but everybody knew it as Ordinary. So when I, I was approached by a chap who wanted to put a brewery into Wimbledon, I said, well, we don't want to use Wombles and you can't use the tennis, but it has got a nice common. And then you can say common, certainly not Ordinary. <laughs> but, uh, um, but there you go. Uh, there's also uh, some Tower Special. Um, and, late edition, he didn't send me any info, but we've got a black IPA. I shall be quiet on that thing, because it's a <laughs> bit of an oxymoron. I'll let Paddy tell you a bit more about IPAs, because I'm sure somebody will ask. Um, he's also brought uh, a wonderful Czech-based lager that they brew at Windsor and Eden. Uh, using salt hops, and there's some salt hops out there, and very traditional uh, European lager style beer, and that's out there as well. Um, so, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to speak. How am I doing on time? Have I done all right? I did, oh, right, sorry. <laughs> I did Poloin, uh, and I know Leonard's in the audience. Thank you very much. I did ask permission, by the way, to use some of the old Beer Academy and Brilliant Beer slides in putting this together, and they very graciously uh, agreed. That's very nice. Fuller's, Windsor and Eaton, and Wimbledon Brewery for the beer. And most importantly, thank you for putting up with me and 40 odd slides in not too long. Yeah, very good. 45. <laughs> I don't know what happens next. Need because mine falls. All right, okay. Oh, there we go. You're straight in, are you? I am. All right. Okay, we're going to move swiftly on to, I think it's, uh, is it Phil going to do next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Phil's going to carry on next, and he's going to talk about um, hops, as I say, the flavour of the decade in the brewing industry. Phil knows a great deal about this, so we'll move swiftly. Oh. So, yeah, I'm brewer not quite as many years in the brew house as these guys, but they do listen to me occasionally. Um, and I like break, making hoppy beers. So somehow I've ended up working for a hop company, um, as you do. So what I've done is I've brought you some hops along. So what I'd like to do is before we dig in, I'd like you to dig into these. So this one, I'm gonna send around here. Stick your face in it, it's not gonna hurt you. <laughs> it is a bag of English hops, these are Bodicea. So feel free, dig in there, break it up, seriously. Steal them, do what you like, but, and it's not going to hurt you on your fingers or anything like that. All those health and safety things we hear here about today. And you guys are going to have so much fun. Because these are a, uh, a Japanese variety grown in the US called Sirachi. And I showed Paddy earlier, and I said, and he goes, cool, can I have them? <laughs> so everything you're going to nick out of this bag is you're going to deprive Paddy of. <laughs> so, and these, will, you'll notice, as you get to swap them around, will smell completely different. Now, I... To use some company information, I work for a company, something like phew, 300 years old, largest hop company in the world, but that's enough of the corporate stuff. Um, I have 170 different varieties on my portfolio. Um, it's crazy for hops right now. People are going absolutely insane for them. Customers, brewers, you name it. It's, I could be, I'm, yeah, I could be selling cocaine or something like that. That's how, <laughs> how insane it is. Um, so let, uh, I was Googling, I don't know, sorry, I was being rude there earlier. I was Googling what, um, where it all started. As Derek said, and um, 
about sort of four or five hundred years ago, the Dutch came over and brought hops with them. They were first using them for antibacterial processes. They were first using them for just stabilizing the beer. Um, and it became quite the, the sort of signal. It was actually banned for a period as well. Um, and it just gone since it's there. And as Derek was saying, hops sort of fell out of fashion. They weren't trendy. But then certainly in the last 10 years, it's gone mental. Um, and what you've got there, um, if you want to take one out, you can actually see the yellow sticky bud. Those of you who like the cousin, you'll recognize that one straight away. <laughs> and the, <laughs> in, hmm? the those, resin. those resins are where all the oils come from. And I was privy to a, an, a sort of conversation last week that the, well, I work with some pretty high quality sort of hop scientists. And I've worked with Paddy on beers, I've worked with Derek on beers. And some of the knowledge we have, empirical knowledge, is up to the minute. The scientists are only just catching up with us. It's fantastic. Um, so what you're, they're, they're discovering in those loopling glands what actually gives us aroma. And believe me, there's so many oils, geraniols, linalols, all these sort of things, that when they break down in the boil, in the fermentation as well, amazingly, um, that's what gives us fine citrus. And if, you, if, you, if the bag's making its way back, that bag there you'll find it's more herbaceous, more lemon, things like that. This one you'll find more grassy, more... That's the stoic British sort of stuff. That's the new wave American. And as it comes back around, you'll see the differences. I've got some more out there, some from Australia. I've got stuff from, um, yeah, Vic Secret, which again is crazy bright citrus. And it just displays the terroir of what the hops as Derek was saying with the grapes, it's effectively the same. I won't say that in public. Um, they are in public. <laughs> seemingly. Um, that they are, there is very much the same thing. So the hops that are grown here versus the hops that are grown in the US versus grown even now in Spain, South Africa, Argentina, a traditionally, that's not traditional hop growing country, but certainly Bavaria, England, here, Kent, Worcester, um, a little bit in Belgium, a little bit in France. That's where the hops come from. And they each display their own uniqueness. Um, and certainly the stuff that comes from the US, Yakima and Idaho, they're the ones that are driving the contemporary aromatic. Um, and as you'll, you'll see in that bag, see that's slowed down. And I bet that, how far is that one bowing back? <laughs> making its way around. What have you found in that bag? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I would just caution the audience in general, because I can Don't see one them. or two people yeah. chewing them. They are intensely bitter. <laughs> so if, you've, if I've left that warning too late, I would just be careful. What you really want to do, if you're, and we're sort of saying this without any um, uh, need for us personally to clean up in the morning, you want to try and rub the hop. Warm it up. Warm it up and smell it, and you'll get what is, what is described as hoppiness. We're very good with words, <laughs> brewers. And you'll get a lot of these fruits and spices and things like that, and a lot of citrus notes. If you want to know what the bitterness tastes of, if you have rubbed them on your hand, you can then taste that greenness that is on your hand. But if you chew one, you'll know straight away what bitterness is. <laughs> They're very bitter. Sorry, Phil. No, no, exactly what Paddy's... I mean, it, it's, it's very hard to sort of take what... Um, the hop can give you and try and take it to a, a layman. Um, because it looks like, quite frankly, just a bag of green cuttings. But the inside that, that is... I've never had, you know, you have conversations with brewers and it's all about, oh, what can you, how do you do this? There, there is more conversation going around what is going on with hops currently than pretty much anything else. Mm, very much. Yeah. Very much. Um, mm. And thankfully, we're starting to see a bit of resurgence in some of the British stuff, mm. so it's, uh, especially Target. Um, <laughs> if you don't, I'm going to speak for Derek here. Derek is a bit of a you know, a hero in London 
certainly London's brewing scene with Young's. If you might have had Young's, was it London Special, wasn't it? Special London Ale. Uh, yeah. It's the big IPA from them. That was all tar well, dry hot with Target. I'm sure mm. it's not a secret anymore. Um, yeah. And that's it. Yeah, stunning big orange marmalade notes. Sriracha that's in that bag over there is all coconutty, somewhat herbally, somewhat fennelly. The one you have here, grassy, it's, uh, the London Porter. Uh, Fuggles is more tobacco-y, fruit, um, sort of, I don't know, what's, what's, it's more, yeah, it's yeah. uniquely earthy. Almost. Earthy, yeah. Mm. Um, just say the Vic Secret out there, you'll find it will be just big tropical notes. These are all from the climatic, from the varietal, from the, the way the hop is treated in country. Um, then it's how it's processed. You're seeing raw, what we call in the, in the trade, a raw whole cone hop. You'll see outside a processed green pellet. It looks like a green rabbit poo. Um, that's actually a type 90. Um, what happens there is we take the whole cone hop. It's fragmented in a hammer mill, under, sometimes under low temperature, sometimes not, um, and should be. Mm. Um, and then it goes through a dye, a dye process, and we get an extruded green pellet. And when Derek and I had conversations a long time ago mm. uh, about dry hopping, um, and I was running a small brew pub in um, Borough Market, and Derek happened to pop in, and we were said, Derek, what do you think about doing this idea of dry hopping, which essentially is using the hops, rather than, rather than in kettle, as Derek described in his slides, um, you're actually putting them in fermentation. So you're trying to extract more of the oils, the volatile stuff, through the fermentation process to actually present a more aromatic beer at tap. Derek's sum total of consultancy was give it a go. It's only 1,000 litres. What can go wrong? <laughs> Bearing in mind, this is the time that Derek was running Fuller's. So if I did this, look how much I'd have to waste. Um, <laughs> cheers, Derek. And, um, but this is that, that conversation then ignited people like Colonel, people like Beavertown, to try these new flavours, flavours that I'd sort of, we were mucking around with mm. and has instigated this revival of London, London brewing, quite frankly. Um, and it's, it's all down to this, these conversations, these, this material, the interest in hops, the interest in beer now. It's, it's, it's exciting times. Okay, we're going to move on to the um, third speaker, because really the two speakers you've just had are in preparation for how to go and do it yourself, right? It's a lot more fun doing it yourself. And inflicting, and cheaper. And inflicting what you produce on your friends. If it's really good, you get all the praise. If it's really bad, well, you've inflicted something on them anyway. If it's really so, bad, you don't tell them. So, absolutely. So I'd like to hand over to Neil, who's going to talk about how to do it yourself using your technical skills in an artful way, how to uh, make beautiful beer. Right, well, you've heard the, uh, the professional methods and all the uh, innovation that's coming to hop growing and the centuries of experience in producing the malt. What happens if you want to piggyback on that and have a play around at home? Um, I've come to beer through a chemistry camera. We heard about that um, in the introduction, so I'll very quickly run through that again, because I've already here. Um, beer Festival started working with the beer in 08. Um, I'm the deputy head seller manager with a really big badge to fit that on um, since uh, a couple of years. Uh, and we have a couple of hundred beers there from across the UK, and part of my role there is looking after the stock temperature and infection control of the beer. The infection control is important. That is a risk whenever you're making the beer. You have to be clean. In the professional world, that's fine. It's all shiny stainless steel. A little bit more difficult in your kitchen. And where we are in the summer, we're in the middle of a field. <coughs> so trying to keep everything clean enough for the beer, stop it from going off, getting those nasty bacteria in is the challenge. Um, we also have the job of fault finding. So the notes we heard about in the um, in the brewing process, the sweet corn diacetyl sort of thing, the skunky flavour in the hop. We don't tend to see that too much. What we can see is youth in the beers. We can see them being aged, turning to vinegar gradually, and it's our job to stop that from reaching the public. Um, it's an awful job testing all the beers, <laughs> they say. But when it's Monday lunchtime and you've had 40 already and still 20 to go before you open, I can't taste a thing. It's not that enjoyable, really. Anyway, I've been doing this at home um, since 2011. And since then, I've done about 60 beers and a few wines as well. Um, it's 
fermentation or making, making them to drink. Um, I've only had to pour one away. I'm quite pleased with that, but there's only three or four that I'm totally happy with, so it's a bit of a way to go, yeah. But I can play with that. Right, um, I'll apologise for the formatting on this. It went a bit haywire when we were setting up. Um, it's still the same underlying process for making beer at home than it is in the professional setting. Uh, extract sugar from malt, then you just put the hops in and extract the flavour from that. You cool it down because you've boiled it to extract the flavour from the hops. You cool it down for the fermentation to take place. Um, and you throw yeast in and it works. That's all very well. It's quite complicated still. Bit of effort. Let's take some shortcuts. You can buy malt sugar ready extracted. Um, it can come as a powder, rather like Ovaltine. In fact, I think Ovaltine is mostly malt extract with a bit of milk powder in as well. This sort of beige sweetish powder, you can buy that and you can use that. So you haven't got to mash anything really, you can just buy it already done. You can take another step out and you can buy hopped malt extract that's uh, usually liquid form, so it's similar to that stuff you might be given as a child. The malt extract with cod liver oil, anyone? <laughs> No, use right. the one with cod liver oil though. Yeah, <laughs> pr pretty grim. Um, it's even more grim if you put hops in there because they're all bitter and nasty. Um, but you can buy that, and that's the those sort of tins that you'll see branded by the breweries uh, with their their branding and the pump clip on the front. You can make this at home. That's what that is. It's already extracted. You put that in water. You throw some yeast in, and eventually you'll get something approaching beer. They're usually pretty decent now. The I hear tell that years ago they were pretty dreadful. Uh, but now you get a pretty decent brew out of them. What you can't do if you take the shortcuts is to play around with the ingredients. Um, I think you said you've got 100 and odd hops on your catalogue. 100, mm -hmm. yeah, we, I've got, yeah, I think there's 215 in the, in the hop world okay. so far. And then now there's, okay. we'll have 170 commercial varieties. Okay, so I, I had a, a quick count up of a, uh, an online supplier um, of homebrew uh, provisions uh, this afternoon, and I counted 51 malts, 72 hops, and 84 different yeasts mm. uh, before I gave up counting. So if you put all those together, there's really quite a lot of variety that you can do, and that's where the enjoyment comes in that I find in homebrewing. You can play around with things, you can pick and choose what you want to do, um, or you can have an easier life, and I've already done for you. Um, I did lie slightly when I said I started brewing in 2011. Um, this is a mostly a collection of anecdotes, and I'll start with the first one. When I was a student, we, we rather liked this equation here. This is RSC, so we <laughs> equations. Um, these turn sugar into alcohol. Um, so we made some ginger beer, in inverted commas, in five litre water containers, you know, things you get from the supermarket. Uh, they are quite useful for storing wine, mostly, but we did um, some brewing in that, and about one in four was drinkable. The rest of it I'd not taken. It was sweet, it was nasty, but we didn't really care because we like this equation here. Mm. I've missed a bit off. That one produces CO2 as a gas, which is quite a lot of gas. Um, the engineering student below me misunderestimated how much gas, and I need to add this in if you're going to do it yourself. Uh, you need to do it in an unsealed <laughs> container. Because <laughs> if you do that, if you don't do that, and you leave it for a weekend, when you come back, they're not going to be sealed anymore. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> anyway, that was a bit of a frame to that. <laughs> what about the kit you need for it? So the ingredients are available. What about the kit? This is a photo I um, took off this to here from Wikimedia Commons, uh, and it's of a commercial brewery somewhere. I don't know which one it is. Um, but you've got these lovely big vessels. I'm guessing that's the mash tun, because you've got a big hole at the bottom for digging out. Looks like it. I'm going to say that looks a kettle, because you've got a big hole at the top for the steam to come out, and that thing over there is probably the fermenting vessel. Mm. Where are you going to do yeah, your fermenting? So we go from you mash in here, you boil and extract the hops in there, and you ferment in that one. I haven't got that. I've got that. Um, that's that's my kitchen. I took that this morning. Um, so it's a plastic box to mash in. I'm being a little bit disingenuous, but I have made beer in these things, which are jam pans and a stock pot at the back there, and a plastic bucket to ferment in. Uh, that's my local exhaust ventilation. I take health and safety very seriously. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of a difference. So, what? Are, oh, oh well, that's my boiler. Um, that's a um, plastic bucket with a kettle element in the bottom. So I can do five liters at a time in that, uh, and it's got a lovely temperature control that's perfectly accurate. Oops. Lovely. <laughs> right. So that's my kit. It's different. It's not what these guys have got. What of that process from the going from the mash to the fermenting and onwards? are important. What can I not cut comas on? 
and what can I change in order to get a beer that is able to be made reasonably at home. I'm going to talk about four things here, four little aspects of that, um, which will touch on where I'm cutting corners and where I really can't. Um, and the first one is the mash. Mashing at home. I started in um, mashing when I went on to using grain um, in something like this. This is not my photograph or my boiler and it's off the internet, so there's the credit. Um, it was a bit iffy because the thermostat didn't work properly. I bought it at a car boot sale. It came with plastic tongs you used to fish your smalls out when you boiled them. <laughs> so I gave it a really good clean and I tried mashing in it. And it didn't really work very well because you can't control the temperature. That's the, um, the plastic box you saw earlier. There's the false bottom so you can get the grain not to mostly come out of the little pipe work at the bottom there. Um, and that's not great for holding temperature either. It's a plastic box, it, you can't add in more heat in it, I can't put it on the stove. You can put more water in, but that's altering everything else going on. It's a bit difficult. That's important, and it's important because you've got a biological process at heart of the mashing process. It's dependent on enzymes. The most important one, I'm going to gloss over lots of others, is amylase. <laughs> I've stolen from... Um, I, well, there's the credit at the bottom. Um, a chap called Dave Line wrote one of the first home brewing books available after it became properly legal to do so in the UK. And he tells a story about Alf and Betty Amylase, and that's how I remember how they work. Um, they are, their job is to chop up the trees, which are the starch, into little sticks, which are the sugars that you can ferment. Uh, and Alf's got a great big axe, and he chops the trees down, chops them into big logs. And Betty's got a pair of scissors, and she comes along and cuts them up into little sticks that the yeast can work on. Um, being written in the 70s, you can get away with that later stereotyping and say, if it got a bit warm, Betty would faint, because she wasn't very um, And that tells you that their temperature profiles are different. So if you go too high, the beta amylase activity falls, you get more of the large sugars which can't be fermented. Um, I'm sorry for the science, it's kind of necessary. Um, if you go too low, then the opposite roughly happens, and what you get is the middle size, the sort of shorter chain uh, logs get all turned into sugars which the yeast can work on. You haven't got anything left in the beer to provide the body, to provide the mouthfeel because it's all been turned to alcohol by the yeast. Not all of it, and the proteins are different as well, but I'm glossing over a bit there, but that's the essential of it. Can we show that by experiment? Well, not intentionally, but I did find an accidental experiment that I've done that shows why the temperature is important. I made um, a beer in 2012, it's my 18th one, and for reasons related to the nasty nickel oiler, I had 62 degrees for the mash temperature, that's quite low. What happened is that the beer came out and it tasted all right, uh, but it needs more multi sweetness as what I've got written in my logbook. I happened a few months later to do a very similar recipe, um, pretty much the same strength, same time for the mash at 65 degrees, not 62. And the tasting note only says excellent, so it must have been good, because I couldn't be bothered to write any more. I was having so much fun drinking it. Um, <laughs> so there we go. That's the temperature controlled mashing, and it was hard. It's not easy to do, given the kit I had, but it's important, because if you get it wrong, the beer's not right. I'm going to talk very briefly about um, liquor treatment. Liquor is water because brewers like to invent words for things that have already got perfectly good words. Uh, we've heard about trub. You could probably call trub a different name. It's just the sort of stuff at the bottom of the thing. So liquor is, is water. Um, I've taken this um, from a colleague of mine at Chemistry Beer Festival who does some brewing as well. And he's told me about his adventures in playing around with water treatment. You can play with a lot of things. You can play with the hardness testing. You can use RO water, which is a purified sort of water, and you can add the salts back into it. You can play around with the pH. You can boil it if you live in London, drop your carbonates out. Emulating, if you want to do a pale beer, something from Burton, the sort of calcium sulfate we heard about earlier. Uh, maybe if you're making a porter, you want a London star water, but I don't live in London, I live in Cambridge, so the waters there are going to be a little bit different. You can play around with this as much as you like. Um, salts, I am told, I haven't checked this, don't blame me if it's wrong. Calcium, um, obviously not calcium, metal, sorry, um, drops the pH and carbonates uh, being, um, being carbonates raise the pH, so you can uh, adjust that depending on what sort of liquor you want. 
but it's hard to do this because a lot of things are going on at the same time. If you can't get your temperature control right in the mash while you're playing around with how much carbonate you've got. You can try it, but it's going to not be as easy as if you had a lab to play with. Um, malts also change your pH, so when you've got it sorted and you do a dark beer instead or you put some black malt in, <laughs> you're going to change your pH again and you have to start from the beginning. So, you might try to get your pH in this. Um, uh, Drew, my friend, tells me that the pH range of 5.2, 5.4 in a bit of empiric evidence makes better beer. So, I haven't bothered with that. I don't think you need to. Part of the professional thing, you wouldn't make a beer for the commercial thing without at least looking at what you're doing with your water, with your liquor. But I'm going to cut corners and ignore all that. Cooling. I put this in so I can show you some <laughs> photographs of equipment, really. Um, when you've boiled your wort, it's at 100-ish degrees, maybe. Um, you can't put yeast in that because it'll, it'll kill the yeast. Again, it's an enzymatic process. It doesn't cook well with the temperature being a bit too high. Cooling a wort. Um, that's, again, a um, photograph sent me by my friend. It's a copper coil in, um, in, a, in a tun there. So you can run cold water through it, a copper apparatus, uh, put your wort in there, and it'll cool it down. It's an inverse radiator. If you want to be a bit more fancy, you can use this. Um, so you can see it's a sort of steel block with four ports on it. Uh, and inside that are a series of plates. You run the wort one way, the water the other. So you've got a nice temperature gradient across it. Nice, efficient way of cooling. And it works really well. I've also got one of those. They take a bit of water to run, and I'm always really conscious about how much water they're using. So I have tried another method, and that I call ambient cooling, because it sounds really fancy if I call it ambient cooling. Uh, you just leave it to cool down in, uh, inside, and it'll, by the following morning, it's probably cooled enough to put your uh, put yeast in. This isn't great for hop aroma, because they uh, the volatile compounds. It's still hot. If you've put hops in late, they're still going to be cooking you're losing the volatiles, so you don't get the hop aroma. Um, when I did, I developed a recipe, and I was reasonably happy with it, doing this ambient cooling method. Then I put the counterflow chiller on it once, and I got this enormous boost of a floral and pineapple note, absolutely delicious hop character, but it was a copper bitter, so I wasn't expecting to have such a change in the hop profile. But again, that taught me that this is something that you really shouldn't skimp on. Um, you put it on the garden or something. <laughs> um, yeah, cooling is important. Temperature, again, we're playing with a live process here. There's too much going on just to leave it to chance. We need to get the temperature sorted. What about storage? You've made all this beer. I've made you know, some of it for a while, and it's, it's quite nice to drink, but um, I'm, I'm the only one in the house who drinks beer, so I tend to, you know, 10 gallons or five gallons, sorry, is, is quite a lot. <clears throat> Um, I can't really get through that in Day. In, um, in, so in a reasonable time. So, so I'm storing a, a fair amount of this. Uh, and I have the luxury that I can do that. I haven't got to sell it to keep the business going. I can put it in a corner and forget about it and do another one the next week. It's a hobby. I, I'm not dependent on getting this stuff out the door. So I can keep it for as long as I've got the space and I can spare the space. That tends to be in the shed, which is cold. So again, temperature control, not ideal in the home setting. If it's cold, things slow down. We're waiting for these to do what they should be doing. But it does keep on working, albeit really quite slowly, and it takes the edge off a nasty beer. Um, again, a sort of inadvertent experiment. I definitely knew in 2013 when I made a fairly strong 1098, about 9.5%-ish um, barley one that I would have this to tell you about this evening. Um, I tested it six months later, it was still going. It took two years, just over two years, until this summer um, for it to finally become good. Some of these can take a little bit of time, and if you're going to make beers at home, I think that's probably the thing I would stress most. Time is the most important ingredient. Right. If you try and rush things, you can do it in a week. It won't be as nice. Leave it a bit longer. It will get better until the point when it starts getting worse again. So it will peak. <laughs> But the long, generally, the longer you can leave things and a little patience will get you there. I've uh, given a 
in, in of course, I know, I've seen enough talks, I can see I've got further work at the end, so what do I want to do now? What are my next plans for putting some science into this? Um, I want to work out a way, if it's possible, to find out the amount of alcohol in a beer, because I guess now by knowing how much sugar there was at the start and ish at the end, can I take the specific gravity, which is the weight of it compared to water, uh, and a device called a refractometer, which measures an optical property, to measure ethanol concentration, given that there's also other stuff dissolved in the beer. If I call all of that sugar, it's mostly sugar. I've got two unknowns. I'm taking two measurements. I should be able to make a graph that will tell me, set of curves, determine the alcohol concentration. Can I do that? I want to find out. Mostly at the festival, I want to find out as well how much CO2, carbon dioxide gas, is there dissolved in the beer. We call this condition because condition doesn't have any other meanings than being brewers. We like arcane terminology. How can I find out? Why is it important? Well, it's important because if you've ever had a flat beer, it's really nasty. Pour, pour a cheap bottle out and leave it overnight and then come back to it in the morning. Morning, don't mind. Um, and it'll be not as pleasant as it was when it had the life in it. CO2 is important. It can be too high. You get this, you know, something you put a flake in. If I can measure it, we can control it better. Can I do that by stirring it and letting the gas leave? Will that work? I want to find out. Um, and then finally, I want to play around with my own recipes and change one thing at a time until I'm happy. I'll end up with really quite a lot of beer after I've done that, especially with 60 odds. They weren't all different, but there's mostly a bit of variety in that. Um, but I'm confounded by my equipment variability. I can't, I'm struggling to keep my temperature control very, within very strict limits, it's pretty much where I want it now, but it's not going to be the same every time. Can I work around that? Probably not. How do I control that if I want to try and get a recipe right? Teasing out the differences between my process and the recipe. If I can't control one, it becomes more difficult. So that's a challenge that I'm looking forward to sorting. Um, I'd like to thank my, so the colleague I mentioned for the um, liquor treatment is Drew Fitzsimmons. Uh, I should also mention um, these, these people at uh, the beer festival and all the cellar team who've got me into beer properly, uh, which got me into homebrewing, which brought me here to tell you about that. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, those who've made access to facilities for my homebrewing possible. Um, these are a really incredibly formatted um, for the benefit of the webcam, I think, rather than if you've got a notepad, um, recipes, the beers I've talked about that I did the experiments on, these are they. Not going to be the same when you make them, because I can't make them the same twice, let alone, <laughs> anybody, let, let alone anybody else. But have a go. There you go. Um, and how are we for time? We've just, you're just finishing right. Just finishing right. Well, these are uh, some adventures I want to do. Who said the EU allergen legislation? 14 allergens you now have to list on prepackaged foods, uh, sesame, various sorts of gluten. Gluten's in beer. Can you put all the others in? What happens if you put fish and crustaceans and egg and soya into beer? Well, you can do it. Don't do it. It was interesting, but you can do it. So I've played around, and the, this is the great thing about homebrewing. The reason I put it in here is to show you can play around as much as you want. You can put soya in beer. You can put tinned anchovies in it if you want. Because it's yours. Do what you like with it. It's, that's where the enjoyment comes in. You can, you can play around. Um, wine, we heard about wine earlier. It was dismissed. Um, wine is brilliant. You can do what you like with wine and it'll tolerate it. It's great to use up fruit that you might have lying around in the hedgerows, plums, anything, strawberries. You can do what you like to it. It'll be fine eventually. Um, and to finish on it, the, uh, the cure-all, um, we briefly heard about Britannomyces, that wild yeast from the uh, that you leave in the louvre at the top of the brewery in the, in the copper tray so the wild yeast can come in. You can buy it in culture. If your beer is a bit nasty, tip it in <laughs> and pretend you meant it to be nasty. <laughs> no, so, um, so, yeah, there, there's some adventures that you can have in brewing and that's um, that sort of it, but a bit of science in there as well should help you get along. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, that um, uh, completes the main talks. It was my job to get these completed uh, by eight o'clock so we could give you plenty of time for uh, questions. However, in the interest of helping to protect the, uh, the panel up here who are all terrified of me passing them questions to them, because we're ahead of eight o'clock, I'm going to give them a little bit of padding. And I'm going to uh, deliver what is called the Paddy Rant. My name's Paddy, and this is the rant you're going to hear. So the rant is that I get people coming to Windsor and Eton from around the world, and they come from around the world, and they'll, they'll turn up and they'll say, we, we really want to see the brewer, is that okay? So I duly appear. And they'll say, um, look, we, we've got a terrible problem. And you say, well, what's the terrible problem? Well, we've come all the way from America to this country because this is the home of IPA. And they say it in a way that really means this is hallowed ground. And they say, the reason we're here, though, is we've been into a couple of pubs and tried to buy IPA, and it's not IPA. Um, can you please help us? We're told that you do some IPAs here. And yes, we show them in, etc. So the reason for the rant is to try and explain to everyone in this uh, audience why this is really important. The, the education system in this country is a disgrace. You'll read about it in the newspapers, you'll hear it on the radio, about appalling, lowering standards, dumbing down of education. All of that is a load of rubbish. The education system in this country is a disgrace because we don't mandatorily teach kids from the age of five what IPA is. <laughs> Now, this is the country that invented all of the good things in the world, I would argue, um, and has even most recently invented uh, the internet and all of that. But all of that pales into insignificance compared with IPA. And yet, the majority of people in this country are completely unaware. And that's something that I personally intend to take every opportunity to put right. So what is IPA? Why does the rest of the world hold Britain and this particular beer in such high esteem? I've got four minutes to deliver this to meet my deadline, but let me start around about 1770. Derek was just a young strapping lad at that time. <laughs> Only just beginning. <laughs> but around about that time, and some of these facts are very dubious and debatable, but I'll deliver them as though they're true. Around about that time, the British industry, brewing industry, faced a catastrophe. And the catastrophe was that the Baltic state nations almost overnight slapped huge duty on the dark beers that were predominantly being produced in Britain at that time and exported to that area. And some estimates reckon that something like 25 to 30 percent of the UK market for beers collapsed in a very short amount of time. Now, many of those breweries went to the wall, but one or two of those breweries decided to fight back and do something different. And you have to try and put this talk into the context of around about 1770, 1780. <coughs> and in one of those boardrooms, and reputedly one of those boardrooms that particularly picked up on it was here in London, a young lad was reported to have said, well, OK, we've lost that export market, but why don't we go for another one? And where might that be? But France is fairly flooded. We give them lots of stuff that they want. The Americans are actually tipping our tea into the uh, ports, etc. Where have you got in mind? Well, there's that new place called India. Now, you've got to try and put your mind around what the world looked like in those days. Well, I've heard of it. I even know someone whose son's been sent out there, but I'm not exactly sure where it is. Well, that's all right. Let's have a go for it. We've got nothing to lose. So they decided to make a beer that was, that could travel to India. Now, to put that into context, I still go into pubs and have people next to me at the bar say, the trouble is cask beer doesn't travel. This was cask beer. So around about 1770, 1780, put your mind as a group of scientists with what you had available in those days. You wanted to send a beer that was not pasteurised, was not filtered, into a wooden barrel. How did you sterilise a wooden barrel in those days? You wanted to then take it to London, the port of London. 
Some of those uh, deliveries went by literally oxen-drawn cart. If you were really lucky, and I know this is sounding like Monty Python, if you were really lucky, you had one of those newfangled things called a canal. So you put your beer in the wooden barrels and you took it to London. When you got to the port of London, you found yourself a friendly captain of a ship and you said, I want you to take this consignment of beer to India. And the captain would say to you, well, that's, that's, that's great. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going. I've never been there before. So you'd give him some directions. You'd say, well, you go down the Thames, you turn right at the bottom, you turn right again, you're in the English Channel. You've been there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Go down the English Channel, you get to the Atlantic, set full sail, and go the way the wind blows. Remember the story about this, 1770, 1780, whatever, you had no engine. Okay, you had no Suez Canal, so you went the way the wind blew. The wind blew you to Brazil. Now, most people in this room have got enough uh, education, <laughs> despite what the papers say, to know that Brazil is not exactly a direct route to India. When you get to India, you take your sails down and you wait, and you wait, and you wait until you get a favourable, very unusual wind that blows down the coast of South America into the uh, Antarctic Ocean. You turn left there and follow the trade winds around the bottom of the world. You don't see Africa. It doesn't exist on this journey. You whip around the bottom of the world. There are stories of people that missed the getting off position and had to try and go around twice. <laughs> you tack out of the Antarctic, you go up through the Indian Ocean, and depending on what directions you've been given in London, you go left or right up the coast of India. You unload your wooden barrels of cask-conditioned beer uh, at the port side, you put it back onto an oxen-drawn cart and head off to the nearest Raj. When you get there, you put your fine beer up onto a wooden stillage, you tap it, and with some flourish you say, here it is, India Pale Ale, all the way from London, Burton-on-Trent, whatever. How on earth did they manage to do this? And this is what really drives these brewers and beer aficionados from around the world to know. You made the beer in three particular styles. First of all, you make the beer blooming strong. I was careful with the language I used there. You make it very strong. For obvious reasons, alcohol tends to be a pretty good sterilant. Secondly, you'd make the beer pretty dry. You'd leave very little of the sugars that Derek was describing earlier because you don't want the beer to be a source that can uh, feed an infection. And, as was described earlier by the, the, the speakers, you'd put a lot of hops in there because they have an antibacterial action. So you end up with a strong, dry, hoppy beer. And the vast majority of those were pale, and I'll argue with Derek forever that some of them can be black. Beers were exported, black beers in the Burton Star, but that's an argument that we'll be having over about six mm. pints. I'll be black and pale, Pat. We're exporting your porter. So the point is, you were able to do that and produce a beer that could travel that way. There are people in America now who are so keen on this story, this mythical beer that could travel around the world in such a way that they will brew this beer, they will put it into wooden barrels, they will then, and they'll put it in at about 17 degrees C, they'll shake it, because it's, be, it's gotta act as though it's going to London. They'll then put it into a temperature control storage Poor old Neil here, he's struggling to get his mashing temperature right. These lunatics are putting it in a temperature controlled unit and they're taking the temperature gently up to Brazilian temperature, OK? <laughs> and, and by the way, don't laugh, I'm right behind them. I think this is brilliant. They will hold it, they will then slowly take the temperature right back down to freezing point. Remember, cask beer has to be treated gently and doesn't travel. Now then shake it again, it's now in the Southern Ocean, let's give it a really good rock around, and then we'll heat it back up to about 35 degrees C as it goes through the Indian Ocean, and then we'll tap it, 
And if it tastes great, they believe they've discovered the secret of India Pale Ale. If it doesn't, then best will in the world. What's the basis of science? More experimentation. Let's start <laughs> again. And all of this goes to show why beer, the understanding of beer, the love of it, and the love of the story and the history behind it makes it such a fantastic industry to be in. So I hope you've enjoyed the talks you've had tonight. Find yourself a real India Pale Ale. They do exist, starting around about 5%. Find yourself a real one and enjoy it. It is better than any bottle of wine you'll ever buy. And I think we're all agreed on that. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, talks. And now it's my job to do the hospital passes of questions and answers. Do you need a you need microphone? Sorry, we're just down. So there's a hop crisis. Um, I understand that we're down something like 30% uh, on yeah, thanks for that one. production. <laughs> this year. Uh, I, 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 I'm feeling a little bit ambivalent about that because I absolutely love these highly dry hopped beers where you know you've got you've got an incredibly dry hop beer and then the next step is to put even more hops in and see quite how far you can go. There is there I will say there is a um, diminishing returns. You, you can you can. Yeah, you can ruin a beer, quite yeah, frankly. I, I, I haven't yet reached that stage, but I'm, not <laughs> sure, I'm sure it will come. Somebody said to me recently, hops are a tool, not a weapon. So, right, yeah. yes, that's, a, that's very nicely put. <laughs> but, uh, I, I wonder if the effect of the hop crisis and also the fact that after a little bit, you want to try something other than an incredibly hop beer is going to give rise to a return to or a revival of or an invention of new types of beers which are less de deeply hot but use other sort of methods, old ales for example, to produce interesting flavours in beers. Okay. And if so, what would they be? What comes next? Okay, before I pass this obviously to Phil, for those that don't know, the hop crisis is that because brewers are on the one hand demand for really aromatic hops is growing at a very steep rate. On the other hand, literally around the world, it just so happens that climatic conditions have affected the growth of hops in almost every one of the major countries that's producing it this year. So you've got the perfect store. Phil, would you like to? Can I ask you your question? There's two ways of looking at it. I was in the US in 2007, 2008. So that was the, what we say the original, that was the first time there was a hop crisis. Um, that again was crop failure, growth in brewers, demand, etc. It did push the brewers to be more creative. Um, breweries I was working in, we used more oak, we were using different yeast, we were looking at different, um, even varieties that had actually done all right in the hop, in, the, in that harvest. So we were looking at producing different beers. So there was, all, I mean, that, this is what Derek and Paddy have been trying to get across is, you know, Jack, uh, Paddy, Derek was saying about being master of, you know, nothing really, a jack of all trades. We're always looking to find a solution for a problem. Um, if, it's, if it's optimization efficiencies in the brew house or fundamentally looking, you're creating a new beer style. Um, but then is also, I can answer the question another way by saying that in the years I've been in the, in the beer scene, um, flavors and taste do change. You, you, and as an indiv individual, you will go through a cycle of, um, you will go through desiring incredibly hoppy beers. You'll go, and then you'll probably come back round to delicate pilsners. Um, it's, it's just where your, your horizons lay right now. I mean, I'm really loving some of the sort of Franconian dry hoppy pills you get down there, but that's where my palate is right now. So it's, it, it, will, it will even out, and it, it's a good challenge for brewers to, to step up to, so. Okay. Um, we heard about the um, importance of temperature control. Um, how did they uh, manage to make sure the temperature was right uh, before the days of um, accurate thermometers? <laughs> One of them. Mm. Stick it in. <laughs> um, it's a very good question. Um, it was trial and error, and it, it really did rely on, just as it does with a cook or a chef, just having the feel for it. 
Um, but it, it was controlled in a number of ways. They would boil and let cool to a, a certain number of hours, but of course that does depend on the ambient temperature, etc. There are various ways in which the brewers had of, of, of doing it, but often it was outside of their control, and I'm sure the variability of, of some of the beers was affected by that. Um, but you did have things like uh, as I mentioned earlier, in Bavaria, they would use the caves where you've got a fairly cons uh, consistent temperature. And indeed, there, there's been a lot of articles recently, and I know that we think that America is quite young, but brewing's been going on in America for many years. Very often, initially, it was based on the British style of brewing, but then more uh, with the, um, <clears throat> the, the more German immigration that you had to the, the middle, uh, middle, middle West and, and, and around there. Uh, then there was a, a, a lot of work done with actually digging caves everywhere, even in Texas. They had breweries which dug caves so you could have a consistent temperature. Um, right underground, and there's a, a lot of a lot of the major cities had these cave networks where they had beer fermentation and maturation going on. So, uh, yeah, and just add to that, Derek mentioned about he put his thumb up that the brewing industry is absolutely full of lots of phrases that you use all the time, and rule of thumb is exactly that. It's a brewer's term. The brewer would literally do that, and when it was just about tolerable and only just tolerable perfect temperature for the uh, i think for the for mashing for mashing okay 60. so six, 60. 65 degrees c yeah. so that's rule of yeah. thumb yeah. the other thing is i think and i'll get this wrong but they used to look at the surface of the hot liquor tank yeah. and there is a temperature at which it develops a, um, a better ability to reflect light. Refraction. Yeah. A, a refraction index, yeah. which is all, also at exactly that point. So literally the brewer would stand there with a, his favorite window behind and go, that's the temperature, off we go. Okay, quite amazing. So they, they also did a lot of, I know this is boiling, this is, he didn't know what it was called then, but this is 100 degrees C. If I mix X amount of this in it, I'll end up with the right temperature if I mix these two things at those proportions. It's exactly the same principle. He keeps all his records. I did it like that, and I wrote excellent at the end. I'll do it the same way this time. Okay? Also more seasonal brewing, wasn't there? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Bit of a home brewing question. Do you find ambient um, cooling is better over than introducing fresh cold water to oh, get your temperature right? Yes, if you, you've only got a small amount of cold water that you can add because you'll have put the amount of malt in at the start um, and balanced the amount of hops as well to get the beer of the strength you want. Um, you, I usually have a few pints worth that I need to put in to get to that point, um, but that's nowhere near enough to bring it down to temperature that you need to ferment. You would need to dilute it out so much, there'd be no point. Uh, several hundred years ago, there was something called small beer. Any idea how strong it was? Derek, do you want to take that one? Yes, um, it, right? it very much depended. The, the, the brewers then would, um, and it did, uh, a lot of the breweries were uh, brewed during, only during the winter months, uh, and the stronger beers would have been brewed and laid down. Uh, typically, the big houses and the monasteries uh, were very much into brewing. Uh, and they had the pick of the stronger beers, if you like. But beer was part of the daily diet, and it was the small beer. Now, what they would do, they would have a double mash system. Uh, I don't, when I did my slide presentation, I talked about the mashing. And nowadays, uh, and Neil talked about as well, the mash, the temperature, etc. And we typically, we do a continuous mash 
and sparge and runoff. So we'll extract all the sugars and materials. But what they did uh, over a hundred, not that long ago actually, I was doing some brewing research and doing some old beers with Fullers called Past Masters. And just over a hundred years ago, and in fact I know 1893, they installed a new bit of equipment, but there they were still doing this two mash system. So you would mash in, you would take your first runnings, which were, had all the stronger wort, so it was the higher concentration of sugars, and then you remashed at a slightly different temperature. So you re-wet it, that goes off to make one beer, your stronger beer, and your remash, and the extract from that was much lower. Now typically that would have been somewhere uh, giving you a beer around about two to three percent. And this is what you drunk on a daily basis, this is what you gave the children. The water wasn't safe to drink, and you drunk this beer around about two to three percent. Still very nutritious. Still had all the goodness from the malt in there. And that was where the small beer come from. You'll still see it in Abbey Singles. Yeah. 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 Does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. The Royal Ration in Elizabethan times was a gallon of beer per day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, they drunk a lot of it. A lot of our... And what's unreasonable about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it was just part... You didn't... It was... There was no tea. There was no coffee. No. You couldn't drink the water. There was no... There was certainly no Coke. No. Uh, so you drank beer. And if you look at the Hogarth's prints of Gin Alley and uh, Beer Street, you'll just see that the beer environment, the people were uh, well fed, looked well nourished, uh, the place was prosperous. And then if you look at Gin Lane or Gin Alley? Gin, Gin Alley. Gin Alley. Uh, you'll see there that the, everything's broken down, people are drunk, babies are being dropped in the Thames. It really was considered part of the daily diet. In Germany, it doesn't carry VAT. It's considered part of the daily diet. It's a, we need to just move back that way. <laughs> it's it's a, Russia's only just changed the tax yeah. laws, didn't they, away yeah. from the bread? Yeah, yeah. no, think, it really was. I think one of the absolute key points about that is, and I think Derek mentioned it earlier in his talk, that actually pathogens find it very difficult and, in fact, don't survive in normal beer because of the low pH, etc. And therefore, you know, one of the reasons that beer spread, it was a, not only a very efficient way of extracting the, the food source from the grain, but it was also, it was a safe way of consuming water. Uh, now, you needed to make it reasonably dilute, but the amount of uh, alcohol that was consumed, no doubt, was considerable because of the sheer volume they had to drink. Okay. It's preserving carbohydrates, isn't it? Mm. I'd just like to make a brief comment, first of all. My German friends call beer liquid bread. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, but I have got a question. Why is it the Americans can produce strong alpha acid hops and we seem to have difficulty in this country? Climate. I remember going around Fuller's Brew and I think the alpha acid contents are about 10 or 12 per cent, whereas in the UK they're about 3 per cent. Yes, it's, it's, it's climate terroir. For one, it's, if you go to Yakima, it's, it's in a, it is a valley like a bowl. Um, it's sunny all the time. Same with Nelson, where you get some of the more aromatic um, kiwi varieties. It's just, it's a beautiful place to be. And then you come down to where I live in Kent, and it's a bit grey and damp at times. Um, <laughs> and then have you been to Birmingham? Yeah, that's where the... <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it is essentially the, the, the terroir. Um, and that's what, and it, they, the varieties, they grow stronger. Oh, they, they, they're selected for those sort of things. I, I'm, I'm, I might just add to that. I think varietal selection and, and plant breeding does uh, have a lot to do with that. Uh, you can get high alpha British hops. There are some nice ones. Uh, Phil mentioned one earlier. Target was one of the first actually developed in 1965. The alpha acid derived, you get the bitterness from the alpha acid. I tend to think that on a personal front um, that the, the bitterness that's derived from high alpha hops is really quite harsh. It's quite astringent. I actually prefer, personally, although it's more, much more expensive, to derive the bitterness from low alpha hops 
and use because they own, not only come with high alpha, but they also come with high oils and essential oils, and those nice aromatic compounds. So I actually prefer, which is a little bit the wrong way round, to dry hop with some of the high alpha varieties, Target being one, Admiral being another. So the age Derek is, is actually coming up with actually where the younger brewers are now going. He mm. uh, sounds a bit backhanded compliment there, Derek, sorry, but it's... I um, think it's come round, we'll be wearing flares. Yeah, it's, it's come round, we? yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, there's my, it's my generation of brewers, it's horrible, mm. um, are looking at the oil content, not just the uh, alpha content and that's it, it's it's for that sensory stuff rather than just so what you're saying it's a more balanced it's not necessarily balanced it's just it's really, i think do you remember Ambongo? there's a lot of beers out there and they they taste like those and that's what people are looking for um and we we work hard to try and provide that flavor okay thanks very much <laughs> one more yep. do one more one more and yeah. i hardly ever buy beer and last time i did it um, tasted very strongly of TCP. I noticed you've got that as one of the flavour things that can be. Was that an accident, or do they try and make beers that taste no. like that? Because it was all. Well, um, uh, <laughs> was it a smoke? Interestingly, beer? Uh, it may have been a smoke beer, but some dark beers have TCP character. You will get phenolic character. It shouldn't be chlorophenolic. You might find it phenolic. And interestingly, Paddy's brought a malt out there, and I'd be interested in your comments out there. It's, a, it's quite a pale malt, it's called amber malt. But for me, it's, um, it's a bit like uh, almost that whiskey type, phenolic -y type taste. Peat smoked. Yeah, it's not peat smoked at all. It's just the way in which it's kilned. That, that makes it derive that way. Uh, you can get smoked malts and you can, uh, as for those whiskey lovers in the audience where it's a malt based drink, this, the process is almost identical at the start when you're making malt whiskey, but you can smoke malts and it will coat with a coating of cyclical aromatic compounds, the phenolic compounds around the outside of the grain which is extracted through. So those, are, but it's not my style of whiskey. I wouldn't drink uh, a heavily peated whiskey, but I know lots of people who do. Yeah, having yeah. Uh, just just to add to that, although there are some beers that um, would have that type of character in, they're unusual, and I'd be surprised if you ordered one without actively knowing you were. So where the heck's that TCP come from? Well, there are lots of ways that things can go wrong, both within the brewery, and we partly mentioned that, but, and a brewer would say this, wouldn't it? Um, almost, most likely to have occurred within the pub itself. And like um, uh, someone in the kitchen not rinsing their um, utensils well, etc., uh, cleaning flavours can come through and can often be that type. You can also get some infections, ironically, that, yeah. that you haven't cleaned away that also produce TCP type flavours. Yeah, I make a beer once, so, it smells like a swimming pool. <laughs> there you go. So those um, types of flavours, I would say um, you need to change the pub you're drinking in. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take, uh, the, there's two hands up, let's take those and then we'll retire for a beer. So sh either way around. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, one last question from me. Um, there is um, uh, this new brewery, uh, Brewdog, who have taken to concentrating beer uh, with things like uh, Sink the Bismarck and uh, Tactical Nuclear Penguin. What's your view of this idea of producing Tactical. beers with uh, very high alcohol content? Um, I think that there's, there's all sorts of um, uh, things I think about it. So, so let me go through one or two. Uh, and again, I'm trying to... Um, answer this on a way that lots of people can understand. Brewdog are a company that have been operating for about six or seven years. Oh, a bit longer guess. than that, I think. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, years, and they have absolutely built a very uh, big and good business. And the great thing they've done is they've made beer drinking, um, uh, not, not single-handedly, but they've made beer drinking very interesting and very fashionable and everything else. They've done that through um, a lot of marketing type things which are 
aimed to be as antagonistic and controversial as possible. And they actively go about doing things like you're just describing, of trying to make the world's strongest beer, and, and a lot of their advertising is very um, uh, controversial, let's put it like that. So um, very mixed views of it. Um, having said all of that, a lot of the beers that Brewdog produce as a company are excellent. And as far as I'm concerned, you can do anything in the world as long as you make excellent beer. That just about releases you of all responsibility for it. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Martin Dickey, he's, he's, a, he's a distiller as much as a brewer. As a, a, he, uh, that's his first passion. Um, and they, they do achieve it through ice distillation. So it's, you know, ice bocking. So it's, it's, I'm sure you guys know the process, just freezing it and um, taking out some bits and retaining others. Um, it's, it's not... It's not that difficult a thing to do, it's if you've got whether, but it, it gets you very good headlines. Mm. You know. And, you know, well done them. I'm not mm. criticising that at all. I think there was one last hand up here, if we could... Uh, well, thank you very, very much for sharing your enthusiasm <laughs> and knowledge. I was just going to put a damper on. When does the Inland Revenue get interested? Mm. When does, when when does Inland Revenue... Do you, uh, do you, I'll, oh. um, I'll, if I may, I'll take this, yeah, I'm sure yeah, yeah. Derek will chip in. Um, the world has changed enormously in this respect. Um, so when I started brewing, um, you know, going back to the late 70s and onwards, um, duty was paid on the wort, the sugar solution that you produce. So long before you actually sold the beer, you paid a duty on a, on a liquid which was part of the process. It always seemed very strange to me. Um, and that had all sorts of consequences. But in some of the large breweries I worked at, there were live-in customs and excise officers. They had flats and they had shift rosters and literally at 3.30 in the morning you may be collecting a wort as it was called and declaring it and suddenly on your shoulder was an excise duty person. Um, the reason I say the world's changed enormously is in two respects, I suppose. The first one is that, um, and Derek will fill me in on the history of this, but quite a long time ago, the country moved to uh, duty at the gate, as it's called. So we now pay duty on all beer that is e effectively that is leaving the brewery, and we pay pr pro rata according to the alcohol, which, by the way, is not a, a uniform system around the world. It's, it's I find it quite staggering, but in this country we pay according to the strength of a beer, and therefore we're quite bold about telling someone, you are getting a 5% beer, you know, this is worth the fact that you've got to pay this for it. In America, I think oh, I'm right in saying you pay a flat rate, and actually, I think I'm right in saying it is illegal to put the strength. Used to be. No, Used to and be. still no, is no, in no, some no, states. No, 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 it's only state to state. Yes, right. in, so some in some states, some states yeah. it's illegal to say what the strength of the beer is, because they think it might encourage people to drink strong stuff. Because remember, the duty rate is flat, and it's one of the reasons why America tends to have produced some really very, very strong beers, because why wouldn't you? There's no excise-related uh, aspect to it. Now, finally, the bit I wanted to say about it, how's the world changed, is um, generally speaking, as in so many ways of taxation, the government and HMRC have moved more and more towards self-regulation. You know what the taxation system is, just send us the cheque. <laughs> um, now, now, that's, um, that's an interesting way of operating. As someone, and I mean this quite generally, who always pays their duty, I wish they policed it more closely. But that's, a, I'm sure, would be uh, something we can discuss over a pint. <laughs> I don't know. The best, best tactic, the well, weirdest one I've had is in Japan, where you have different ingredients put you into a category of beer and non-beer, and then you have a different tax rate for non-beer versus beer, different tax rate for different tiers. Uh, it, you, no. It's very complicated. Okay. The, the, the last thing to say on it, though, I hope, before we do have a, a drink, is um, don't forget, UK duty rates are some of the highest in the world. They are punitive and they are the reason why we don't drink more liquid bread. Okay? Right. Um, we've... Home brewing. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry, home brewing, there is no taxation on home brewing and hasn't been since um, Gordon Brown, was it? No, yeah, 77. 77. 77, was it? So it is, was it is free of that and there has been an enormous yeah. growth in it as a result. But they could sell it to their friends? No, 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 no you no, can't no, no. sell it. So it, effectively it is taxation if you wish to sell. And they're quite canny about that sort of thing. So if I have, for instance, a brewery tour where I give away some beer, I pay duty. Okay, you can't, you know, it's not easy, even though I'm, if you like, deriving money indirectly, they're, they're clever enough to know that's... An extreme, an extreme example of it is in Norway where you have incredibly high taxes on beer. Um, you know, you're talking eight to 10 pounds uh, for a 40 cl glass of beer. Um, you have, there's, it's per capita, it's got the highest density of home brewers in the world. And um, so much so, I said, sorry, I'm gonna close out quickly, but I sat down on the plane and the guy looked at me beside him and he said, where are you from? And I said, oh, yeah, England. He said, well, what do you do? I said, hops. Oh, really? And first thing, he's asking me for samples. And because there's so many home brewers in Norway, it's insane. And it's because they, they, they club together to produce beer for their little community and, and things like that to avoid the duty. So. Any more questions? I think it would be best over a drink. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Can I just thank the speakers? <laughs>